that we record. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, here is afternoon, so uh, good afternoon, good virtual afternoon, everyone. And so our speaker today is Guo Chuan Tiang from Peking University and uh, on what is a course index physically. So please go, go, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Jenny, for the introduction. Uh, also, good evening from, uh, from over here in China. Um, so my talk today is uh, maybe somewhat expository. So it's um, on uh, what's a cost index. Uh, and um, I would like to convey some uh, perspectives which I gained as I was coming in from a kind of mathematical physics background. So uh, to the subject of uh, cost index theory. Um, so some of my collaborators uh, is Matthias Ludwig from Regensburg and uh, Yosuke Kubota. Uh, he's moved to Shinshu University in Japan. Right, so index theory. Now, um, index theory, of course, uh, everyone knows uh, Tia Singer, um, index theorem. So I try, I try to condense it into one line with not many complications. And uh, in the, from the physics perspective, we are interested in Dirac operators on compact spin manifolds. Um, so let me just get my uh, pointer up, right? So I hope the laser pointer works. On, yeah, we on can see. Okay, very good. So, so, so we, we've got X, which is a uh, compact spin manifold. So we've got the Dirac operator describing the fermions. Um, and usually you have this problem where you want to count the zero modes or uh, to count whether they, 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 they kind of cancel each other out. So the Tier Singer uh, index theorem tells you uh, sometimes you can't get the cancellation. And uh, the leftover number of uh, uh, left-handed zero modes minus right-handed zero modes, uh, it's determined by some topological invariance of the manifold in question. And very crucially, and this is the ingredient that uh, came from physics, which is that um, one should not really just study the, the bad Dirac operator, but you should also couple it to a gauge field. So, so on top on top of the uh, the classical geometric structure, you also have this uh, this principal bundle and uh, connections. And so, the topology of the manifold and the gauge field together determine in the Tia Singer formula the number of uh, zero modes. So, why are these why are these uh, zero modes important? Or why, why is the fact that you can't get rid of these zero modes uh, important? Well, um, it's important when you when you do this uh, quantization procedure. So when you, when, you, when you quantize the uh, wave equations describing fermions and the couple to gauge fields, then, uh, then if you don't have the, uh, uh, if you have these zero modes, then in, in the quantization, you have this uh, degenerate uh, vacuum. If you can't get, get rid of them, they, they lead to anomalies or some, some sort of non-conservation and uh, basically problems in quantum field theory. So there was a lot of interplay between the, the 60s discovery of uh, uh, Tia Singer, and also when, when Witten and uh, collaborators came into the game. And then many Fields medals and Apple prizes have been given. Everyone knows about this. And most of the applications um, um, appeared in high energy physics, gauge theory, and string theory. Um, I want to advertise a new development, um, relatively new development in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, something called topological phases. Um, the, uh, the current understanding of these things is not complete yet. And uh, today I would like to, to convey the idea that really what, what the, the physicists talking about topological phases, what they're doing really is uh, realizing uh, index theory in the laboratory. And more specifically, I'll, I'll, I'll try to convince you that it's got to do with cost index theory. So, um, oops, right. Now, um, before I go to the cost theory, let me just mention that this aspect of physics is actually somewhat old. It started in the 1980s. And if you want to trace it all the way back, it's almost 100 years old. So in, uh, in the 1930s, uh, Landau solved a very important spectral problem um, um, where, he, where he solved the Schrodinger problem for an electron on the Euclidean plane, which is then subject to a uniform magnetic field. So this is called the magnetic Schrodinger operator, uh, magnetic Laplacian. Um, or the Landau operator. And it's basically a geometric operator. It's, you, you just take the, the exterior derivative on, on functions uh, uh, twisted by some uh, connection 
and then you, you put the uh, add join in front of it. So it's a, it's a twisted Laplacian. So, um, so, so he solved the spectral problem, and I'll, I'll come to this later on. And um, it was not really until the 1980s that a remarkable experiment uh, was done. So, they, so, so this Landau operator is supposed to describe, as I said, electrons subject to this magnetic field. So it's, it's shown in this picture on the left here. Um, and then, and then uh, so the experimentalist did the setup and tried to measure some, some, uh, something called the Hall conductance. And it turns out, uh, um, lo and behold, uh, something very strange happens. You get these uh, plateau, this quantization of the Hall conductance that appears. And um, so it was very hard to explain this. And um, to this day, people are still arguing about, about why, why exactly these things appear. But everyone seems to agree that there's some topology. Some, 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 something is invariant under deformations, okay, which, uh, which governs this, uh, this phenomenon. And this is such an important experiment, uh, arguably the the most important or maybe second or third most important experiment in, uh, in low energy physics. Okay, so richly rewarded with lots of Nobel prizes. Um, then non commutative geometry came to the game um, after Kahn developed his uh, wonderful theory. Um, so the main actor in this subject is Sean Bellisat and, uh, and collaborators. So Pelendong, Prodan and Schultz powders also made a lot of contributions. And essentially, they uncovered that you could use the non-commutative geometry of the so-called momentum space, describing the quantum Hall effect uh, uh, setup. Um, you can put it to great use and actually explain a lot of features of the experiment, which, uh, which the classical geometry doesn't quite, uh, doesn't quite suffice. At the same time, uh, there was a parallel universe of a uh, cost index theory, which was being developed as I understand. And somehow it developed a little bit disjointly from, from, from the physics. Um, but for now, because um, actually uh, my collaborator in 2016 introduced the idea that, that you can have cost topological phases and uh, uh, Ewart and Ralph Meyer in 2019 um, also studied the use of cost geometry or row algebras in, uh, in lattice models. Um, so I'd like to go a little bit further and actually go to cost index theory. To, to, to explain these, uh, these phenomena, and more generally the phenomenon of uh, topological phase. So, so why cause um, instead of uh, something simple, like, like a nice regular lattice? Uh, so in the old days, people studied homogeneous uh, geometries. And this was in some sense a matter of convenience because you could get some exactly solvable models. And so the, in, on, in the previous slide, you see this is a very homogeneous Euclidean plane. You, you put in a very uniform magnetic field you measure, you measure the uh, uh, quantum Hall effect. Okay. But today, uh, in topological phases, it turns out experimentalists have discovered you don't need really any homogeneity whatsoever. So, so this is the idea of uh, amorphous topological phases. So, so you really basically just need a, a bunch of uh, a metric space, essentially, which is not sufficiently well behaved. No, no regularity is required whatsoever. And um, and you, you can carry out the analog of the quantum Hall effect on this, uh, this sort of amorphous two-dimensional surface. Okay. And then, and then the, the, signature, the signature effect is that on the boundary, on the one-dimensional boundary of such a material, you get these uh, so-called H modes. Okay. So I won't go very much into the physics of this, uh, this, this setup, but just to show you some pictures <laughs> to, that, that these are real experiments that people have found. Okay. So here, here's, here's the, here's the uh, very disordered or very amorphous lattice in which people have successfully set up a topological insulator and measured the H modes that go around in one direction uh, of the boundary. Okay, so these things are real. And, um, and, and, and it, 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 should, uh, it should sort of indicate that really the, the metric structure, only the cause aspect of the metric structure is really important to the phenomenon. Okay. Um, in some sense, and this is somehow not very well known in, in the physics community, um, even though the, 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 the main contributor to this subject is, uh, is uh, uh, Alexei Kitaev. So in, in two papers in the mid-2000s, he actually uh, anticipated that you could use cost geometry and uh, homology in, 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 in this subject. Okay. So um, I took the liberty to to highlight a few of um, the, the pertinent parts of his paper, where he mentions things like cost geometry, uh, cost graining. He's got something which looks very much like a certain decay condition on, on operators, which is the, 
um, generalization of um, finite propagation properties. Um, and so, so this was in a paper where he, he was talking really about uh, anions and he wanted to use it in topological quantum computing. Okay. But um, in this, this, this part of the paper, I don't think many people read it, even though I think it's probably the most important part. So, so cost, cost, at least the words cost geometry then appeared already. Um, another place where it appeared was in a subsequent paper in I think 2006 or 2007, where he introduced the so-called famous periodic table for topological insulators and superconductors. So this is the paper that suggested you could use uh, K-theory or Bob periodicity to do a classification scheme for uh, all the possible uh, topological uh, phases of matter. So the precise meaning of that statement is, uh, is, 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 is up for debate, but I would just like to highlight a sort of theorem. Well, I, maybe I should erase the word theorem here, but it's really a suggestion because uh, it was never explained. Um, but the idea is that um, you might use k-homology groups of, uh, of some metric spaces to, to describe uh, non-homogeneous uh, 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 physical systems. And, and they can have some uh, topological insulator features. Okay. And uh, the, the two references he gave in, in the paper uh, uh, were very familiar things to people working in cost geometry. So the Hickson wrote a book on analytic K homology, and of course the, the, uh, the, the Bible of uh, non-commutative geometry of uh, Alan Kahn. Now, um, I first want to point out also the, the, uh, the book of John Rowe from which uh, I learned almost everything I know about, about cost geometry and index theory. Right, <clears throat> so that's a bit of background from, from, from physics and, and maybe from now on, uh, maybe a little bit more mathematical. Um, and um, actually, uh, I should mention, please uh, feel free to interrupt me when, if you have any questions, uh, uh, because I'm, I'm going to go a little bit more heavily into the uh, mathematics from now on. We'll have tremendous when they're back on our confrontation with the Chinese Communist Party. And, um, but that's why I think it's now, if anybody needs prayers, and he'd be the first to say, don't do that, or won't hear that, because he's, he's uh, as you know, just not a very, not only a very private individual, he would never uh, put any of his burdens on anybody else. And he would, I think he'd be even embarrassed of me talking about it. And this is the first time I've really talked about it. I think now, more than ever, we need to pray for Brother Miles because he's in a fight and he gets a thousand times worse than anybody else. And so this is a huge development. But I also think in this process, you're going to see other developments. What is going on? Sorry. Uh, I, yeah, sorry. Um, and I, I couldn't hear the first half of uh, the comment. And actually, I wasn't sure who was giving the comment. But was it a comment for to talk or was it some telephone call or whatever? And... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, sorry, could the person commenting uh, maybe repeat? I think it was some Yang Liu, is that correct? Yang, was it you? Ah, sorry. <laughs> you were, okay, ah. right. So, so Yang was talking on the phone. Okay, <laughs> please go, oh. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, Okay, so so if the, yeah, so if there wasn't any question. Maybe I'll I'll start on the uh, the 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 cost geometry part part of the story. Um, so the 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 cost geometry, at least uh, uh, um, from from what I know, um, um, very much developed by Rowe, John Rowe, um, and I'm not going to go into the complications of the the construction of the Rowe C style algebras and all the various versions of it. I'll just give the most the version which is most usable for uh, physical problems. So this, the, the setup is you generally have a Riemannian manifold and on a Riemannian manifold, you have the uh, L2 space, space of wave functions. And then you consider the, the bounded operators on L2 of X and you just take those which are finite propagation and uh, locally compact. So finite propagation just means you move supports, supports of uh, the wave functions a finite distance and locally compact just means uh, um, if you if you if you truncate your operators into a, a, a compact subset of X, then you get a compact operator. So it's a, it's an analog of a compact resolvent or elliptic regularity um, um, 
um, in, in, in the context of possibly non-compact manifolds. So uh, a, a key thing you need to do is to complete this to a C-style algebra. And this, this really helps you to do all the K-theory computations. Okay. So, so amazingly, as I said, uh, the K-theory of the row C-style algebra of the Riemannian manifold X can actually, have, uh, can actually be non-trivial. So this calcul uh, the, the calculation would seem to be hopeless abstractly from the, from the pure C-style algebra point of view. But amazingly, you can calculate it by considering that it's assembled uh, geometrically from K-homology data. Okay. So this English sentence is my, my interpretation of the cost uh, bound corner assembly method. Okay. Um, so, so this is a great, great technique. And in this subject, as I have uh, learned from various talks, usually, usually um, it goes as, the applications goes as follows. You have Dirac operators. Uh, by construction, it has a finite propagation speed. Uh, so it, it propagates things at the speed of light. And then, um, and then, you, and then you say, okay, fine, the, the resolvents will lie inside the, the row C star algebra. And, and then you can construct a so-called cost index, which is valued in the K-theory of the row algebra. And such an index, such an abstract index turns out by some geometric identities uh, to obstruct the existence of certain types of uh, positive scalar curvature metrics. And so this, this seems to me to be the main uh, application of the cost index theory so far. Um, so I'm not, I'm not from this part of uh, mathematics. So I come from mathematical physics side. So when I was learning these things some uh, three years ago, I, I was actually right now I'm also very much a beginner. And some basic questions about the, the, the subject puzzled me. So I was looking for examples, and um, the basic examples when something non-trivial happens uh, already appears for Euclidean spaces. So for the Euclidean line, the row algebra is known to have uh, K1 group being isomorphic to the integers. And for the Euclidean plane, the row algebra has K0 group isomorphic to the integers. So I really wanted to get hold of concrete generators of these, uh, these K-theory groups in order to understand them better. Um, it's not so easy to find. In fact, I could, could not find any of this in the literature. So I uh, studied, started, started to construct them uh, by myself. I'll give you some uh, concrete generators later on. Um, and, and the second thing is um, there is, for, in, in the realm of the discrete world, where you replace the manifold by a costly equivalent discrete version, a lot of people study these uh, discrete metric spaces. And, and then I was curious to find out what the index theoretic meaning of the K-theory groups of such row algebras were. Right, <clears throat> so now I'll go on to the uh, one-dimensional story. Um, again, I go back to history and remind you of the very, very first index theorem, which is, uh, I think, 101 years old by now. And um, it comes from the, 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 the observation that uh, there exists things like fret home operators. So the basic example of a fret home operator is the unilateral, unilateral shift on uh, the L2 space of the natural numbers. So here's the matrix, which describes it. It's, uh, it's just got ones on the sub diagonal. So it's a very simple operator. And pictorially, it just hops, uh, hops to adjacent points. If, you're, if you think of the basis elements as being arranged on a half line. So this unilateral shift is just a truncation of the bilateral shift S uh, on the L2 space of the integers. And after a Fourier transform, the symbol function is simply the, uh, the identity function on the, on the Fourier transform circle. And so, so uh, in the language of tuplets operators, this unilateral shift operator is a tuplets operator with, uh, with this symbol. Then the theorem of uh, Noether from 1921 is that uh, the fret home index, well, this is a fret home operator, this unilateral shift, and its uh, fret home index can be computed by the winding number of the symbol function. So in this case, we just get minus one, and you can verify in this exactly solvable example that uh, this index theorem holds. Uh, what's this got to do with cost index theory? So I'll explain it now. Um, it's via something called the quantized flow of unitary. So let's go back to the bilateral shift operator. So it's just, it's just translating everything to the right by one unit. And a very key observation is that this shift operator S uh, propagates um, with finite distance, in fact, with distance one. So if you were to split 
the line into two parts, a left half and a right half, and, and, uh, and, and, and you denote the respective projection operators by A and B. Okay. So A is the, uh, is the characteristic function on the right half line and B is the characteristic function on the left half line. Okay. So these are projections. Then the commutator of the projection A uh, with the shift S would be a finite rank operator. And you can, uh, you can, you can uh, calculate the trace of S star times this, uh, this derivation. And this is nothing but the trace after a little bit of algebra, the trace of the conjugated projection minus the original projection. Okay. So you have a right half projection and you want to compare it with the conjugated uh, right half projection. So we've got basically two infinite dimensional projections and somehow their difference is a trace class operator and you want to compute its trace. So in this particular example, the right hand side here is unchanged by truncating to finite uh, the finite rank subspace near the partition. And this is because of the, uh, the finite propagation uh, property of S. And so, so the differences of the trace of these two infinite projections, you can actually just calculate uh, from the uh, truncations. And so you just get difference of trace of two finite rank projections. And so you have an integer on the right side. So the something rather surprising is that if you have more generally, if you have two projections, uh, bounded projections, so they're infinite dimensional, and if the difference is a trace class operator, then actually the trace is an integer. So this is of course not obvious a priori, but turns out to be true. And, um, and there's some proof of this uh, initially by Efros and then uh, Evron, Seiler and Simon, when they introduced the uh, very famous relative index of projections in the paper in 94, uh, in, uh, General functional analysis. So the construction above actually generalizes to finite propagation and locally trace class unitary operators. Or more precisely, unitary operators which differ from the identity by a finite propagation and locally trace class operator. So you can think of this very as something like a cyclic one co cycle, which I'll uh, 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 explain in the next slide. And actually, the argument that I in, that in, in the first half of this slide was actually given in the paper of Kitaev in 06. So <clears throat> now, odd index. Um, so rows, odd index, as I'll, as I'll explain, is very intimately related to this uh, quantized flow of unitaries. And um, I'll just remind you of uh, what happens in one dimension, this odd index. So what you have is, a, is, is the Euclidean line and, and the L2 space on the Euclidean line. And then um, um, instead of the, the, the translations, on the Euclidean lines generated by the momentum operator. The momentum operator in, in physics is this operator here, minus ID by the X. And that's nothing other than the Dirac operator on the, uh, on the Euclidean line. <clears throat> so it exponentiates to the translation operator. So the, the thing now is uh, we've got unbounded operators. So what do we do? We do the usual thing. You regularize it by applying this, uh, this cutoff, this switching function. Um, so this function chi has limits plus and minus one as, uh, as you go to plus and minus infinity. So it basically compresses the very large spectra towards plus and minus one. So you have a bounded transform. Once you do this, then the unitary that you obtain after you exponentiate it um, will be this exponential of pi i chi of d. And the, the thing I want to emphasize now is that the, the Dirac operator initially has full spectrum. The spectrum is the entire real line. And then the unitary correspondingly will have spectrum uh, in the entire unit circle. So both of these have a uh, full spectrum and this is nothing but a kind of Cayley transform. <clears throat> then uh, the way- Corinne, will... I have a question. Go ahead, yes. So if you are taking this exponential of pi i, Yep. Uh, do you really need to uh, to apply this function high for d? Uh, yes, yes. So the 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 point is uh, in the next slide, next part where you need to show that this exponential defines a class in the row uh, in the in the k one group of the row algebra, and membership in this row algebra means you need to be uh, you need to be almost like the identity operator up to up to an element in the row algebra. So, so this pi i, uh, 
uh, ensures that the very most of the spectrum, the very large and very small uh, uh, spectrum, after you exponentiate it, it becomes minus of the identity operator. Okay. So you sort of you sort of uh, take the real line and you wrap it around u one exactly once. Yes, yes, I'm fine with this exponential part and with this pi i. By I'm uh, I'm asking about this high function he. Oh, this 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 chi. Yeah. yeah. This chi. Sorry, this chi. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. So if you don't have the chi, then what will happen is that this real this real numbers will be will be wrapped around u one infinitely many times. You basically just get the uh, the covering space map. What you want to do is actually wrap r around u one once. Ah, so you compare I, I see. Okay, now I see. Thank that, you. that part is quite important. Okay, that, that part is very important, and that's that's essentially the reason why you need this chi. Hopefully that uh, answers your question. And only after you do oh, this, yes. then you can Thank define you. this cost index properly. So um, having defined this cost, uh, sorry, this uh, this class, uh, uh, this unitary representing a class in this row algebra, um, Rho then constructed a cyclic one whole cycle, uh, which eats up one of these K theory classes, basically using a partition uh, and using the formula that I described in the previous slide. Okay. So what is this? this this definition is really, really a, a way to measure the flow of the regularized unitary on, on the manifold R. Okay. And the, this unit, regularized unitary is the, is the uh, uh, exponential of this, uh, this Dirac operator. <clears throat> now this cyclic one co-cycle can also take in the, the S, which I described earlier on, which is why I just, in the previous slide, I, I, I claimed that this is a formula for cyclic one co-cycle. And this is one way to, to see that uh, you can get an explicit generator of this K theory group uh, by the so-called hopping operator. So you think of a discrete set of points, but really each point carries one uh, quantum degree of freedom. So you have a copy of the regular representation of Z. And then what S is doing is, the, is just the unitary which hops uh, one step along this, this discretized line. This unitary is, ex, ex, is explicitly a, a generator of this K1 group of the rule algebra. Okay. <clears throat> so that partially answers uh, one of my questions. Um, I'm not sure if uh, anyone, uh, anyone had some independent reason to find, to ask such, such a question, but that was quite important um, uh, for, for some subsequent work, which I'll explain later. So um, back to the, a bit of physics jargon. So this one dimensional uh, uh, Dirac operator um, is known in the physics literature uh, to have uh, something called a chiral anomaly. Okay. And um, I won't explain what a chiral anomaly is, but uh, you, you should think of it as a symptom of the Dirac operator having a full spectrum. So there are no gaps at all in its spectrum. And furthermore, this gaplessness is, uh, is a stable thing. If you, took this, if you took the Dirac operator and you added any bounded perturbation potential whatsoever, it continues to have full spectrum. Okay, so there's no way to actually open up gaps in the spectrum unless you, you put in some unbounded potential. Okay. So in this sense, this anomaly is something topological and the topological protection is by the cost index in, from the previous slide. And um, if you have minus D instead, then really you have the momentum operator propagating to the left. And the direct sum of these two operators is, uh, has no anomaly. Uh, in fact, a physicist will immediately see that if you take this direct sum and you put the uh, off-diagonal mass term, then the spectrum will develop a mass gap. Okay. So d plus minus d um, has no anomaly, and it has it has a spectral gap. And the property of the odd cost index is that um, the moment you have a spectral gap, then the the Dirac operator will, will have trivial uh, trivial cost index. Okay. <clears throat> um, so D, D, the, 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 the operator D having uh, uh, being anomalous seems to be something bad, but actually, uh, remarkably, you can actually find it. Uh, and it appears on the boundary of a two-dimensional system. So even though on its own in a one-dimensional manifold, we cannot produce this physically, this Dirac operator, which propagates uh, along the one-dimensional manifold, you actually can produce an analog of it on the boundary of a two-dimensional topological insulator. Um, and uh, and then you, here's a little pictorial thing, and you, you, it's you, this this sort of operator 
which uh, propagates uh, along the boundary of a two-dimensional sample. Uh, it, it's, it's called the H following topological states, uh, which I investigated in a paper uh, from two years ago. And is basically what you see in this picture, okay, in the earlier picture. Except now, with some hindsight, there is no particular reason to set up a model in which everything is nice and regular, in which all your lattice points are nice and regularly spaced. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> so uh, I'll move on to the two-dimensional story now. So hopefully everyone knows what an odd cost index now is, at least for the simplest example of uh, the Euclidean line. Now I'll go on to the, the simplest example of uh, the Euclidean plane and explain what the cost index means there. <clears throat> okay, so on the Euclidean plane, the Dirac operator, uh, it, it acts on the uh, spinner bundle, which has a, a positive and negative chirality sector. So it's a great, it's a Z mod two graded uh, Dirac operator. So it's an odd operator and specifically it looks like this. It's an off diagonal operator and you've got the holomorphic differential on one side and the anti-holomorphic differential on the other side. Right, so the holomorphic differential we recall is just d by dx minus i times d by dy. So if you want, this is the Dobo uh, Dirac operator uh, on the Euclidean plane thought of as a, as a Riemann surface. <clears throat> um, now this Dirac operator, again, has a abstract cost index. If you go through the machine of Rho's definition, you find that it's supposed also to generate the K-theory group of the Rho algebra of, uh, of the Euclidean plane. And uh, a rather non-trivial calculation shows that this is, uh, this is also the integers. Okay. So I, I'm burying a lot of uh, rather difficult calculations here, but one knows that it's the integers and that the, the Dirac operator uh, has a cost index living in there. Um, that's all well and fine, but what exactly does it count? And what's it, what has it got to do with the counting of zero modes that, uh, that, that was really the, uh, the reason why people study a tier single index in, um, in, in, in physics? I'll give the answer now. And um, one, one thing you can do is that on, in this very homogeneous space, you can do the Fourier transform. And if you do the Fourier transform of this Dirac operator, um, then at each point Z in the uh, Fourier transform complex plane, uh, the holomorphic differential just turns into Z bar, and then this one turns into Z. Okay, so we have a very simple two by two matrix for each, for each value in the so-called momentum space. Um, so you have a family of, of two by two permission matrices. And this is an invertible self adjoint family parametrized by the, the, the momentum space. And it's invertible everywhere except for some very special point. Exactly. Right. May, may I have a question? Yeah, go ahead. So, so I don't understand why this gives you a family, since if you apply a Fourier transform, then you get the operator of multiplication by, yes, by, by Z, am I right? Yeah, yeah, so these are multiplication operators. So for each value of Z in the, in the Fourier transform uh, of, of R, you have one of these multiplication operators. So it's a direct, when you Fourier transform D, you get a direct integral of, uh, uh, maybe I should write it down. Um, uh, I need a pen, so, uh, so you have a, oops, you have a, you have a direct integral of C in R hat square of DZ. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so D is equal isomorphic. Uh, if you want, this is the spectral theorem for D. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so this is the family is parametrized by, by this Z param parameter Z. Okay, so there are two, so at each point in Z, there are two eigenvalues. So here and here. Yeah, <clears throat> plus or minus the absolute value of Z. Except here is the right point. Okay, and something so, very in, in some sense, this uh, sorry, this Fourier transform gives you one operator which is a multiplication, but this multiplication yeah. operator uh, is uh, consisting from the whole this whole family as a direct integral. Yes, yes, yeah. So, so you have okay. a family of these, yes. uh, these uh, uh, multiplication operators, and at z equals to zero, uh, it's actually the zero operator, okay. and everywhere else, it's an invertible operator. 
So, uh, so, so something seems to be happening at z equals to zero. Uh, this is called the Dirac point, and uh, it appears in, in in something called graphene. And and the physicists are convinced that you can't you can't get rid of the Dirac point. So something is protecting the Dirac point, and uh, no one seems to know what exactly is protecting the Dirac point. Um, so I'll explain what's what's protecting the Dirac point. Um, oh, I've got to get rid of all these scribbles. Right. Um, so the correct way to count the kernel, the zero modes or the index is really to do a family's index. And uh, so you need to perturb, perturb the, the model because, because you have a family in which the dimension of the kernel jumps discontinuously. So the way you, 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 uh, you, you count the kernel is to do some stabilization and you follow the prescription of a tier singer in their family's uh, index paper. So basically you just enhance the operator by two, uh, two trivial uh, line bundles, and then you put in this, uh, this perturbation here. Okay. Then you do a calculation, you can, you can find that the kernel, the kernel of uh, the, the left-handed kernel is one dimensional, the right-handed kernel is one dimensional. Okay. This does not mean it cancels, and this is the point of the in family's index, is that you have to regard these as an index bundle. So you don't just count the rank, but you count how the eigenspaces are varying, the kernels are varying uh, according to the parameter space. So pictorially, what's happened is you added two, uh, you, you added two degrees of freedom per, 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 per point, and then you introduce this t, and, you, and then the perturbation produces a gap around zero. But the zero mode can never be killed because it comprises of a line bundle uh, it comprises the difference of two line bundles. Okay, so the first line bundle the, in the calculation, you will actually be the bot bundle or the tautological bundle over the complex plane regarded as, uh, 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 yeah, right, right, the tautological bundle over, over, over the complex plane regarded as CP1 with a point removed. And then you have a trivial line bundle in the other case. So this index bundle, you can think of as the equivariant version of the cost index of the Dirac operator. Because in the Fourier transform, we've used the translation invariance and we are calculating everything uh, uh, translation invariantly. So that's, uh, that's the cost index of the Dirac operator, or at least on the Euclidean plane. Okay. So the way to understand it as kernel minus co-kernel is to introduce a perturbation, which introduces gaps around zero. This cannot get this cannot kill the kernel entirely, but at least you have some sensible kernel, which uh, which which gives you projective modules or give you uh, index bundles um, in this particular case. And um, you could also do everything equivalently only with respect to a lattice. And what I described is essentially the bound corner assembly map for the for the discrete group C squared. Um, and this sort of construction actually has appeared in the literature in um, T duality, topological T duality. So everything is actually uh, related to, to the Atiyah Singer um, story. The, 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 the cost index for the Euclidean plane is related to the Atiyah Singer families index. Um, I think I'm going a bit slowly, so let me speed up a little bit. <clears throat> um, now you might not be so happy that you need, needed to take a difference of two projections. So um, a more sensible way to get a single projection, which represents the generator of the K theory of the row algebra of the plane is to consider the Landau operator, which I uh, dis described all the way back in my second slide, I think. So you, instead of the bare Dirac operator, you actually couple it to a constant curvature connection uh, on, on the line bundle. So explicitly, the Dirac operator turns into this. So the, the blue terms are these extra, uh, extra covariant derivative terms. Okay. And then if you square this operator, you get the Landau operator in, in both, the di both the diagonal pieces, uh, but there's a little shift of plus and minus b. This is basically a supersymmetry argument. And from, from this, you immediately see that the spectrum of the, the Landau operator is a discrete set of points is a is a odd integers multiplied by b. So b here is a real number describing the strength of the magnetic field, so the curvature of the gauge field. So the spectrum of the Landau operator, as already computed in 1930 by Landau, is a discrete set of points evenly spaced, 
And uh, I, I've just given you a modern kind of pure geometric uh, estimate or calculation of the spectrum. It's basically an application of the Lichnerowitz identity where the square of the Dirac operator is the Laplace operator up to some curvature terms. So the curvature terms are these things in blue and it cause this so-called Landau quantization. So from this observation, we immediately see that for the lowest Landau level, so this eigenspace here, um, its kernel is infinite dimensional and the projection onto this kernel is nothing but a cost index of the Dirac operator. So the only thing is you need to twist the Dirac operator, then you can isolate the kernel in the spectrum and the kernel projection is precisely the cost index. So this is, an, this is a very explicit projection because you even know what the eigenfunctions are. So, so the generator of the K-theory group of the rho algebra for the Euclidean plane has an explicit projection representing it. And that's simply given by the projection onto the lowest Landau level, uh, which appears in the quantum Hall effect. Now this identification is not only important, uh, at least in my, in my view, in, in, uh, for understanding the, the row algebras uh, more concretely, um, it's important for this so-called boundary correspondence. Um, so this, this, this identification of the Landau eigenspace as the Dirac cost index appeared in a paper with uh, my collaborator Ludwig. Um, in, actually in two papers, uh, just this year and last year. So the, the idea is that in, in cost geometry, one has the, the principle that the, if you have a Dirac operator on a manifold with boundary, then there's, there's something called the boundary of the Dirac operator equals to the Dirac operator on the boundary. Okay, this is just a slogan, but this principle can be made precise in the context that, uh, of the quantum Hall effect. And, and it produces the following theorem, a rather remarkable result which is um, if you restrict the Landau operator uh, onto a half space. So instead of the whole Euclidean plane, you take a half Euclidean plane and you can be very sloppy about choosing this half, half space. Okay, so you just need, need it to be a cost half space. Then the spectrum becomes unbroken, okay, becomes gapless. In fact, it, it, all the gaps between the Landau levels get completely filled up. So the spectrum of the Landau operator on a half space is a subset of of uh, the interval from B to infinity. Okay. <clears throat> and um, so, so basically the idea is that, is that um, once you introduce a boundary, then the Dirac operator has a contribution uh, from the Dirac operator on the boundary. And we just saw earlier on that in one dimension, the Dirac operator on a one dimensional manifold um, is, is the anomalous operator, which is gapless and is associated with this chiral current. So these are the famous H states that go around the uh, uh, quantum hall insulator in, in the physics uh, experiments. Now, so why, why did I uh, emphasize the cost geometry story? Because the calculations are extremely uh, robust. They're all, they're all cost geometry invariant. This means that the boundary gapless uh, solutions, they are actually extremely robust. So you, you can choose your boundaries in all sorts of different ways. You can even chop little holes into your sample. It doesn't matter. And, um, and this is important because uh, supposedly for any of these things to be useful, um, they need to be indestructible um, with respect to geometric deformations. So, so, so sometimes a, a physicist will say, okay, you take a topological insulator, it's two dimensional. If you hit it with a hammer, you will not destroy it. Okay. So the, when, when they say something like this, what they, what they really mean is you, can, you can, can bend and stretch the sample. So it's embedding in Euclidean three-dimensional space. It's allowed to change, but you will not destroy the topological insulator phenomenon. Okay. So the cost geometry is preserved during this, this process uh, and the calculations are preserved. And that's why, uh, that's why this, uh, uh, this, this, this previous argument continues to hold. And this is the robustness uh, argument. You can do the same thing for the hyperbolic plane. And there, you, there the calculation requires use of uh, um, the cost bump con conjecture that, that it is verified in that case. So you can actually do the calculations in the, exactly the same way as on the Euclidean plane. So you have the same sort of gap filling uh, result in that, in that case. Okay. Um, now, I've Euclidean plane and Hyperbolic plane are homogeneous spaces. And I emphasized earlier on that really you don't need any homogeneous homogeneity. So um, the, in the geometric story, 
these lambda operators, they're, they're basically Laplacians coupled to some gauge field. So they're very geometric operators. And you can actually estimate their spectrum uh, from, from the scalar curvature data and the, the gauge field curvature data. <clears throat> and the effect of these curvatures, if they're, if they're not constant, so they're very non-homogeneous, if they're not constant, then what will happen is that the Landau levels, essentially, they start to broaden. Instead of a single highly degenerate point, they broaden into bands, and then the spectral gaps will start to close. When you do this, then you no longer have spe the spectral projections being inside the row algebra. So the arguments that I gave just now will break down. Nevertheless, uh, so with, with uh, Kubota and Ludwig, we discovered actually you can preserve these spectral gaps, provided you work in a delocalized sense. So you instead of working with the usual row algebra, you mod up by all the uh, row subalgebras which are localized near submanifolds. Okay. So for instance, we're, we're studying this helical surface, and the helical surface has a lot of curvature along its axis, and this causes problems in the arguments. So what, what you did was you take the row algebra modulo, the start algebra, which is localized near to the axis. Then all the calculations carry over and, and allows us to prove uh, a conjecture from, uh, from physics, actually, that you always get these helical states that propagate along the axis of, uh, of a helical surface. So if you do the quantum Hall experiment on the uh, helical surface, you should get the helically propagating state. <clears throat> okay, so the delocalization uh, you should keep in mind because it's going to be the focus of the last part of my, my talk, uh, which is about row algebras and uh, something to do with discretization of space. <clears throat> so um, so my, I, I started off with trying to understand what projections in row algebras uh, look like. In particular, I was interested in what non-trivial projections look like. Okay. So, so these row algebras can have non-trivial K-theory. So they can have non-trivial projections in the K-theory sense. And what does that actually mean? So one, one way to produce such a projection is to look at the kernel of a twisted Dirac operator. Okay. But this is, again, still quite abstract. Okay, how, how do you actually I'll give you a projection? How do you see that it is non-trivial? What, what does non-triviality mean? And the answer is that the range of a non-trivial projection so this will be a Hilbert space, a Hilbert subspace of L2 of X. Okay. So the range of a non-trivial projection is highly delocalized in a sense which I'll try to make uh, precise in the next, in the remaining slides. <clears throat> so here's a fun fact <clears throat> uh, as, a, as a kind of a taster. Um, if you take two copies of the regular representation on a, on a lattice, then inside two copies of the regular representation that actually exists a rather interesting copy of the regular representation whose basis functions are very delocalized. So by, by which I mean, of course, you don't just take one piece of this, oops, one piece of this uh, direct sum. It's a very complicated uh, superposition, okay, which is isomorphic to the regular representation. So, so what it, this is, it doesn't look like the picture on the left-hand side. So the basis functions, they don't look like this, but they look like the blue things, the blue ones on the right side. So at, over each point of the lattice, the basis functions actually have, uh, have, amplitudes, have amplitudes that persist very, very far away from the center. Okay, so they're not point-like basis functions. And you can never find point-like basis functions for this copy of the regular representation. Um, this idea is known already to physicists as something called one-year non-localizability. So in uh, 2007, uh, some physicists discovered there are some uh, there are some breakdowns in the idea of uh, these uh, atomic uh, lattice models for 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 uh, electrons. And uh, the the idea is that um, um, of, of of these one-year bases is that. Well, you, you have a crystalline material, and so it's, it's a bunch of atomic cores, and the positions of these atomic cores form a classical lattice. So, so there's a copy of Z2 inside the Euclidean plane. Okay. And then what you want to do is to produce uh, a bunch of uh, wave functions, a basis of wave functions, which, are, which, I, which I call gamma, gamma pullback of W, where gamma 
gamma is the translation. So you start with a function w, and then you have all of its translates by a lattice. So a one-year basis is one where this is an orthonormal basis. And this orthonormal basis is supposed to span some relevant spectral subspace of, uh, of, the, of the full Hilbert space. Okay, so we have a little small spectral subspace of a full Hilbert space, which is supposed to be spanned by the translates of these wave functions. And these are supposed to uh, play the role of the electron orbitals. And then you start to produce this uh, so-called tight binding Hilbert space. So tight binding Hilbert space really come as embedded copies of regular representations inside the L2 space of the, of the manifold in which the lattice is embedded. So the basic idea is that you have a classical discretization of a space. Okay, so you have the manifold R2, and then you chop it up into a, you, you, you choose a lattice of points to discretize it. And when you do quantum mechanics, you really want to put one quantum degree of freedom on each point. Um, and so, so you, you think of having a copy of the regular representation of a lattice sitting inside the, the space of wave functions. Now for this prescription to work, you really usually want this wave function to be well localized. Otherwise, the above process is a bad lattice approximation. And it, it, for a long time, it wasn't known whether you could always do this lattice approximation. And it turns out you, you, there are situations where you cannot do it. Okay. So um, abstracting this problem, uh, there's a general problem. So if you have the, a manifold X and you have a Hilbert subspace of this manifold X, is it possible to discretize it as follows, discretize the Hilbert space as follows? So can you find some uniformly discrete subset of X together with a uniformly localized orthonormal basis to span that Hilbert subspace? Okay. So uniformly localized basis just means the following uh, kind of a polynomial decay condition or faster than polynomial decay condition. Okay. And uh, the, the, if you don't really uh, understand these, these estimates, the motivation is that you're looking for a point-like basis of wave functions to, to describe the Hilbert subspace H. Um, it turns out the answer is no. And the obstruction is precisely the cause, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, K-theory class in the row algebra. So if you have a projection in the row C star algebra of X, and you know that it's k-theoretically non-trivial, then it's impossible to find a uniformly localized orthonormal basis for the range of this projection, no matter what choice of uniformly discrete subset you choose as the centers of this uh, orthonormal basis. Okay. So this means that the k-theory class of a projection in the row algebra is really measuring a degree of delocalization for the range of the projection. So it tells you that the range of the projection can never look like the left-hand side, but must always look like the right-hand side. <clears throat> um, and the argument is quite simple. Um, if your Hilbert space can be spanned by very localized wave function, so suppose they are even disjointly and compactly supported, then a classical splitting of a space into two pieces, x1 and x2, just directly corresponds to a quantum splitting of their respective projections. Okay. And, uh, and oh, I forgot to mention a kind of a flask decomposition assumption. So this is, this is satisfying for almost all spaces of, uh, of interest. Okay, so this, this flask de decomposition assumption. Um, so if your Hilbert space is spannable by this sort of very well localized uh, basis wave functions, then the total projection uh, will be automatically be trivial. Um, normally, you cannot do this, but you can still find some uniformly localized basis. So there's a little bit of spreading of the wave functions, the basis wave functions. So even if you chop your space up into two pieces, the wave functions spread out a little bit from the left side to the right side. But if they don't spread out too much, you can still construct the von Neumann equivalence to the previous case inside the row algebra. But if they spread out extremely much, spread out too much, then you can never produce this equivalence. And this means that your, your, your Hilbert subspace actually has irremovable long range quantum overlaps. Okay. <clears throat> so it's got to do with uh, an obstruction to lifting a classical discretization to a quantum discretization. <clears throat> um, and these examples exist. 
So for example, the lambda levels of the quantum hall uh, of the lambda operator uh, exhibit such a delocalization. And in fact, this is known uh, from uh, theoretical and experimental arguments. Um, so now then the question is, how do you quantify this sort of large scale quantum overlaps? And uh, in fact, in the, in the paper of Kitaev that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my talk, there are some indications how you could do this. Uh, it was never made really precise, but you can construct something like a two current instead of the, uh, instead of the flow that I described for one dimensions. So basically you do a multi-partition. Instead of partitioning your space into two, two pieces, you partition it into three pieces and you do a little kind of clever combination of, uh, of the matrix elements of your projection. Okay. So if you're interested in this, uh, go look at this paper or I can, I can discuss this with you later. Um, essentially, I believe you, you can promote this sort of idea into a cyclical cycles, uh, defined on suitable row subalgebra. Now, um, I looked in the literature and, uh, and, and perhaps experts on this subject can enlighten me. Uh, I believe not very much non commutative geometry per se has been done for row algebras, meaning to say there's not really a theory or, or, very, or very many examples in which cyclic cohomologies have been defined on, uh, on suitable uh, subalgebras of the row algebra. And you need that in order to pair the K theory and uh, produce some physical meaning. Um, the discussion I, 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 I gave, I didn't give details, but there are very close relations to the idea of coarse homology theory and uh, the mayer viatory sequences in coarse geometry uh, from work of Hickson, Rowe, and Yu. And uh, of course, I like a little bit in, in, in physical samples, you have a finite sample. So all, all the experiments require a fairly large number large sample relative to the natural lattice distance scales. So in order, of, so you need some quantitative estimates on the so-called uh, quantitative K-theory estimates. And this, I think is a very nice theory of Oyono, Oyono and Yu on this. And finally, and this is the bit which I can never convince people to study, which is the, the KO version of everything that I've said. Okay, so the KO homology is of interest in particular, the most interesting bits are, are the torsion groups that appear in the KO homology. And I believe not, there's almost nothing in the literature on the cost KO homology. So I think these three things are part of a program which I've tried to promote uh, in, this, in this talk. Um, so uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, uh, hopefully there are some questions uh, and, and uh, um, that everyone learned a little bit from, from, from my talk today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Guo, for this very nice talk. So any, any question or remark or whatever? Walter. No, Walter, you are just uploading. <laughs> okay. And any question? Yeah, please don't be shy, especially if, uh, <laughs> don't be shy. in cost geometry, I have many things to ask myself. Okay, so maybe maybe Adam and then Magnus. Sure. Okay, so, so my question is the following. So um, do you believe that there is some relation with this uh, coarse uh, geometry point of view of the theory of renormalization? So if we view... Uh, yes. If we are believe, um, if we agree that we are looking, uh, we are working in the momentum space, then this process of zooming out somehow should correspond to probing our space with <laughs> higher and higher energy. So, so maybe there yeah, is a link. That is correct. Uh, in fact, uh, I mumbled something about T duality here, and this appears when you are trying to calculate the cost index of the Dirac operator with respect to the translation invariance of a lattice. So over here, the lattice, you have the freedom of precisely in choosing the scale of this lattice. And uh, increasing the size of this lattice means that in momentum space, the corresponding reciprocal lattice uh, shrinks in size. Okay. So you have the freedom to do this. And this freedom is uh, actually in the idea of this uh, T duality. So the, 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 this renormalization idea, I believe is related in this, this sort of zooming out, zooming in and zooming out process. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a precise answer, but I, uh, my intuition is that the answer is yes. And uh, um, uh, that, that's as much as I can say for now. <laughs> yeah. 
There's, there's a lot, of course, also the regularization story, which is not quite renormalization, but it's uh, it's related. Yeah. So um, at some point in the future, I hope to concretely make this connection. So there is some link, but uh, still this situation is not uh, completely understood, yes? Uh, it's not completely understood, but the cost index of many, many of these Dirac operators seem to be uh, invariant, or at least it extracts the so-called renormalization invariant parts of the phenomenon mm -hmm. that, uh, that you're describing. So it throws away irrelevant information and keeps the relevant things which uh, I guess is what renormalization is supposed to do. Uh, so, so that's the rough idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's Magnus. Oh, hi, thank Magnus. you. Hi. hi. I was just wondering, you said this thing about the Landa Hamiltonian on a coarse half plane having the spectrum V to infinity. Uh, this thing? Yeah. I, yep, yep. Wh what are the boundary conditions for that to be true? Uh, oh, very good question. Uh, no conditions. Okay, to be precise, uh, you just need a self-adjoint boundary condition and, and you need a semi-boundedness. So there are some very, very kind of stupid boundary conditions where you, where you lose the semi-boundedness. I, I don't think that's true. I mean, like there's a, there are several results saying that this, this spectrum is exactly theta zero times b where theta zero is this constant which is roughly 0 0.59 and this is only so true for half plane. You have some results that say what that the the spectrum is continuous mm -hmm. and is from theta zero times b to infinity and theta zero is a universal constant appearing yeah. basically yeah. as What's as the infimum of the spectrum theta zero the is infimum uh, of the spectrum yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there could, there could be some eigenvalues below here as well. Yeah. No, no, there's so continuous spectrum. There's continuous oh, yeah, so spectrum it could below. Extend below as well. The spectrum could extend below as well, but from B onwards, it's, uh, it's unbroken. Yeah. So, so from B onwards, it's unbroken. It's a little subset here. Okay. Here. Yeah. Oh, but it should be the other way because it's bigger than B to infinity. The other way? I mean, it goes to negative this infinity. No, no, I mean, it goes from a number smaller than B. Oh, yeah, I don't have the lower bound here. Yeah, yeah. But if you start from B, then it will go to infinity. Yeah. So I don't know what the, the lower bound here depends on the, on the boundary conditions, I suppose. Yeah. So, so the inclusion is the other way. Yeah, yeah. So you need the inclusion, yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, okay. um, there are also some very weird boundary conditions. Um, but so if you play it safe and restrict to these local elliptic boundary conditions, then you'll be fine. Yeah. So Dirichlet, in fact, this is this calculation is known in the Dirichlet and the Neumann. You can solve the problems uh, exactly. And the spectrum is in the Dirichlet problem, I think it starts from B. And for the Neumann, probably starts a little bit below. I'm not sure exactly where it starts. But both of them have unbroken spectrum from B to infinity. Yeah. And then the question is, um, what about other boundary conditions? And what about other, other half spaces which are not perfect lines, um, perfect half spaces? Then the idea is that you use the cost geometry uh, argument to, uh, to show that the, an index uh, survives on the boundary. And this index, because it survives, once, once you have a non-vanishing index on the boundary, it tells you that the spectrum cannot be broken. That's the, that's the idea. Um. <clears throat> okay, Magnus, are you satisfied? <laughs> I, I'm satisfied. <laughs> I, I think there is a talk, there is a question in the chat. Uh, Mark Collin, do you want to ask it? Mark, do you want to ask directly? Any physical relevance of these quantum overlaps? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay, so please. Yes. yes. So the, uh, the formula here. Um, if you, if you work in a setting where you have a regular lattice, so the lattice is Z2, then this formula is equivalent to the churn number formula that appears in physics, uh, which works in a Fourier transform uh, version of what I described. And in that case, that calculation of that churn number is 
directly related to the value of the quantized Hall conductance in the Landau uh, in the quantum Hall experiment. So uh, uh, yeah, so yes, it's related to the quantum Hall conductance. Yeah. There is also a previous to, uh, uh, question. In fact, what do you mean by the flow over here, which uh, was oh, asked? Flow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a unitary. So so so. Uh, right. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, there's a definite. There's 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 there's, there's a definition. But so you have a, a a is a half space projection. So it's an infinite dimensional projection. And then the unitary s uh, uh, is a conjugated version. So so the difference of these two projections tells you how many how many states are being uh, transferred from. Uh, from the left side to the right side. So the how, how the dimension of the projection on the right side has changed uh, after you apply S. So it's how many units of charge is being pumped across the partition. Okay. So the, the problem of course is that individually these operators are infinite dimensional. So you cannot calculate the, num the, the size of these projections individually. Mm -hmm. okay. So these are, these are infinite dimensional projections. But the point is that the difference is trace class. So you can take infinity minus infinity and get an integer. Okay, and this is the, this is a, uh, in fact, it's, it, this is precisely the Fred Hoop uh, from the uh, relative index of a pair of projections as defined by Evron, Sala, and Simon. And in this particular case, the two projections are related by a conjugation by a unitary. So it's telling you how many, how many states uh, are being introduced by S to the right half of the space. So that's the flow, how much, how many. And from this picture, it's apparent that once you apply S, you float, one state is float from the left to the right. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Any, any other question, comment? I think Adam again. Please. Yes, maybe maybe one more. So uh, there is uh, this notion of this uh, gram of Hausdorff distance between compact metric spaces. And uh, uh, do you know any any version of this uh, gram of Hausdorff distance in this context of coarse geometry? <laughs> I think I'm not qualified to answer anything uh, useful in that in that context. Do uh, you, you have any any ideas? I I, I don't know. I was looking more at cost index for these manifolds. No, no, the idea is only very, very rough that in some sense uh, you are exactly zooming out and viewing your space from, from the distance. So this is some right. sort of, uh, of approximation of spaces, but, mm -hmm. but this gram of Hausdorff distance works in, in compact case. So, so this is maybe not so uh, suited to this, uh, this coarse uh, geometry point of view. Yeah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's why I'm asking if there is a version. But Gromov has said many things about this cost geometry as well. Right? <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm, mm. yeah, maybe, if, maybe you have to ask him. <laughs> okay. I don't really know this, yeah. There is a very long question in the, in the chat. Could you read it, Uh Yeah, um, okay. So the, the, the question is about cost equivalence. So the, the lattice, uh, many, or like the lone sets are cost equivalent to the manifold in which they are taken from, from which they're taken. Um, and so the answer is, uh, it suffices to look at the row algebra, but you need to take the so-called uh, uh, non-uniform row algebra, I think, yeah, yeah. So, so okay. uh, the answer is yes, up to some, Dep it depends exactly on what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. There, there are situations where the uniform one is maybe, maybe relevant, but the calculations are different. And uh, I think the non-uniform one is more useful and it's more directly related to the, the rule algebra on the manifold. <clears throat> okay, uh, any other question, comment? Um, okay, there is a comment because I remember you wrote an article on the hyperbolic case. Go, you want to comment on the comment? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, it's the same, 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 same thing with the hyperbolic case. Uh, 
case, but uh, that, 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 that two differences. Um, the, the, the first thing is the calculations in the hyperbolic plane are similar to the Euclidean plane, um, essentially because you can use the cause bump con conjecture in that situation. However, uh, this last part, which I talked about, this, this last part uh, does not work for the hyperbolic plane because, uh, at least I don't know that whether it works because it does not satisfy the uh, uh, geometric growth condition. Um, so, so the localization for this sort of basis, usually you want at least some sort of polynomial decay condition, preferably exponential decay, but it's very difficult to, to formalize. And uh, if you don't have a kind of polynomial growth, polynomial volume growth condition on your manifold, then you, can, uh, you cannot prove this, this result. Yeah. So certain, certain things, where once you start doing these sort of estimates, then not everything reduces simply to uh, K theory calculations. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, maybe another question by Colin. I see, okay. Colin, it's, uh, I guess you have to read it. Uh, okay, physical SP, I read it. Physical SP, I can see why one physicist would want to kill Dirac, Dirac not Dirac, Dirac points. Yeah. Uh, but you mentioned that it is almost impossible to do so. Could you speak a little more on this, some construction or, or rough idea on why such points never manage? Uh, hmm. I, I, I try to explain this by a calculation. So, um, yeah. If if you're happy with the calculation, this gives us a sort of explanation. Um, I actually don't have any further conceptual uh, uh, explanation, ex except that the answer will be similar to what the meaning of the families index in uh, in a tier singer. What 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 that means. So, so you do the families index when you have a family of these uh, 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 elliptic operators, and uh, and then you have kernels which may not, uh, whose dimensions may jump discontinuously. But the index, the index doesn't, the Fredholm index doesn't jump discontinuously. Um, nevertheless, they never cancel each other out globally, because while the Fredholm index vanishes, may, may vanish point wise, um, the index bundle doesn't vanish. So, so they cannot, uh, in, 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 in the language of supersymmetry, the left and right handed kernel bundles are not isomorphic. So you cannot couple them and then open up a mass gap by putting some kind of mass coupling term. So in that sense, the zeros, the zeros cannot cancel. That's, the, that's roughly the idea of the the family's index. And this is the same story over here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Guo, for the great talk and for the great answering all these questions. We've been abusing you a bit, but you did a great job. Anyhow. Oh. Thank you. I mean, I don't think there is any other uh, any other question unless no. Okay. So thank you, Guo. And oh, you. see you guys in two weeks. All right. Yeah. Thanks all for your questions. Thank you, Google.